Section 5 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. The Man Who Found Out. Chapter 3. A year passed slowly by, and at the end of it Dr. Laidlaw had found it necessary to sever his working connection with his friend and one-time leader. Professor Ebor was no longer the same man. The light had gone out of his life. The laboratory was closed, and he no longer put pen to paper or applied his mind to a single problem. In the short space of a few months he had passed from a hale and hearty man of late middle life to the condition of old age, a man collapsed and on the edge of dissolution. Death, it was plain, lay waiting for him in the shadows of any day, and he knew it. To describe faithfully the nature of this profound alteration in his character and temperament is not easy, but Dr. Laidlaw summed it up to himself in three words, loss of hope. The splendid mental powers remained indeed undimmed but the incentive to use them to use them for the help of others had gone the character still held to its fine and unselfish habits of years but the far goal to which they had been the leading strings had faded away the desire for knowledge knowledge for its own sake had died and the passionate hope which hitherto had animated with tireless energy the heart and brain of the splendidly equipped intellect had suffered total eclipse. The central fires had gone out. Nothing was worth doing, thinking, or working for. There was nothing to work for any longer. The professor's first step was to recall as many of his books as possible. His second was to close his laboratory and stop all research. He gave no explanation. He invited no questions. His whole personality crumbled away, so to speak, till his daily life became a mere mechanical process of clothing the body, feeding the body, keeping it in good health so as to avoid physical discomfort, and above all, doing nothing that could interfere with sleep. The professor did everything he could to lengthen the hours of sleep, and therefore of forgetfulness. It was all clear enough to Dr. Laidlaw. A weaker man, he knew, would have sought to lose himself in one form or another of sensual indulgence, sleeping draughts, drink, the first pleasures that came to hand. Self-destruction would have been the method of a little bolder type, and deliberate evil-doing, poisoning with his awful knowledge all he could, the means of still another kind of man. Mark Eber was none of these. He held himself under fine control, facing silently and without complaint the terrible facts he honestly believed himself to have been unfortunate enough to discover. Even to his intimate friend and assistant, Dr. Laidlaw, he vouchsafed no word of true explanation or lament. He went straight forward to the end, knowing full well that the end was not very far away. And death came very quietly one day to him, as he was sitting in the armchair of the study, directly facing the doors of the laboratory, the doors that no longer opened. Dr. Laidlaw, by happy chance, was with him at the time, and just able to reach his side in response to the sudden painful efforts for breath, just in time, too, to catch the murmured words that fell from the pallid lips, like a message from the other side of the grave. Read them if you must, and if you can, destroy. But his voice sank so low that Dr. Laidlaw only just caught the dying syllables. But never, never give them to the world. And like a grey bundle of dust loosely gathered up in an old garment, the professor sank back into his chair and expired. But this was only the death of the body. His spirit had died two years before. Chapter 4 The estate of the dead man was small and uncomplicated. 
and Dr. Laidlaw, as sole executor and residuary legatee, had no difficulty in setting it up. A month after the funeral, he was sitting alone in his upstairs library, the last sad duties completed, and his mind full of poignant memories and regrets for the loss of a friend he had revered and loved, and to whom his debt was so incalculably great. The last two years, indeed, had been for him terrible. To watch the swift decay of the greatest combination of heart and brain he had ever known, and to realize he was powerless to help, was a source of profound grief to him that would remain to the end of his days. At the same time, an insatiable curiosity possessed him. The study of dementia was, of course, outside his special province as a specialist, but he knew enough of it to understand how small a matter might be the actual cause of how great an illusion, and he had been devoured from the very beginning by a ceaseless and increasing anxiety to know what the professor had found in the sands of Chaldea, what these precious tablets of the gods might be, and particularly, for this was the real cause that had sapped the man's sanity and hope, what the inscription was that he had believed to have deciphered thereon. The curious feature of it all to his own mind was that whereas his friend had dreamed of finding a message of glorious hope and comfort, he had apparently found, so far as he had found anything intelligible at all, and not invented the whole thing in his dementia, that the secret of the world and the meaning of life and death was of so terrible a nature that it robbed the heart of courage and the soul of hope. What then could be the contents of the little brown parcel the professor had bequeathed to him with his pregnant dying sentences. Actually, his hand was trembling as he turned to the writing table and began slowly to unfasten a small old-fashioned desk on which the small gilt initials M.E. stood forth as a melancholy memento. He put the key into the lock and half turned it, and then suddenly he stopped and looked about him. Was that sound at the back of the room? It was just as though someone had laughed, and then tried to smother the laugh with a cough. A slight shiver ran over him as he stood listening. This is absurd, he said aloud, too absurd for belief, that I should be so nervous. It's the effect of curiosity unduly prolonged. He smiled a little sadly, and his eyes wandered to the blue summer sky and the plain trees swaying in the wind below his window. It's the reaction, he continued the curiosity of two years to be quenched in a single moment. The nervous tension, of course, must be considerable. He turned back to the brown desk and opened it without further delay. His hand was firm now, and he took out the paper parcel that lay inside without a tremor. It was heavy. A moment later there lay on the table before him a couple of weather-worn plaques of grey stone. They looked like stone, although they felt like metal on which he saw markings of a curious character that might have been the mere tracings of natural forces through the ages, or equally well the half-obliterated hieroglyphics cut upon their surface in past centuries by the more or less untutored hand of a common scribe. He lifted each stone in turn and examined it carefully. It seemed to him that a faint glow of heat passed from the substance into his skin and he put them down again suddenly, as with a gesture of uneasiness. A very clever or a very imaginative man, he said to himself, who could squeeze the secrets of life and death from such broken lines as those. And then he turned to a yellow envelope lying beside them in the desk, with a single word on the outside in the writing of the professor, the word translation. Now, he thought taking it up with a sudden violence to conceal his nervousness. Now for the great solution, now to learn the meaning of the worlds, and why mankind was made, and why discipline is worth while, and sacrifice and pain the true law of advancement. There was the shadow of a sneer in his voice, and yet something in him shivered at the same time. He held the envelope as though weighing it in his hand, his mind pondering many things, then curiosity won the day, and he suddenly tore it open with the gesture of an actor who tears open a letter on the stage, knowing there is no real writing inside at all. A page of finely written script 
in the late scientist's handwriting lay before him. He read it through from beginning to end, missing no word, uttering each syllable distinctly under his breath as he read. The pallor of his face grew ghastly. As he neared the end, he began to shake all over, as with ague. His breath came heavily in gasps. He still gripped the sheet of paper, however, and deliberately, as by an intense effort of will, read it through a second time from beginning to end. And this time, as the last syllable dropped from his lips, the whole face of the man flamed with a sudden and terrible anger. His skin became deep, deep red, and he clenched his teeth. With all the strength of his vigorous soul, he was struggling to keep control of himself. For perhaps five minutes he stood there, beside the table, without stirring a muscle. He might have been carved out of stone. His eyes were shut, and only the heaving of the chest betrayed the fact that he was a living being. And then with a strange quietness he lit a match and applied it to the sheet of paper he held in his hand. The ashes fell slowly about him, piece by piece, and he blew them from the window sill into the air his eyes following them as they floated away on the summer wind that breathed so warmly over the world. He turned back slowly into the room, although his actions and movements were absolutely steady and controlled. It was clear that he was on the edge of violent action. A hurricane might burst upon the still room at any moment. His muscles were tense and rigid, and then suddenly he whitened, collapsed, and sank backwards into a chair, like a tumbled bundle of inert matter, he had fainted. In less than half an hour he recovered consciousness and sat up. As before he made no sound, not a syllable passed his lips. He rose quietly and looked about the room, and then he did a curious thing. Taking a heavy stick from the rack in the corner, he approached the mantelpiece, and with a heavy, shattering blow he smashed the clock to pieces. The glass fell in shivering atoms. Cease your lying voice forever, he said, in a curiously still, even tone. There is no such thing as time. He took the watch from his pocket, swung it round several times by the long gold chain, smashed it into smithereens against the wall with a single blow, and then walked into his laboratory next door, and hung its broken body on the bones of the skeleton in the corner of the room. Let one damned mockery hang upon another, he said, smiling oddly. Delusions, both of you, and cruel as false. He slowly moved back to the front room. He stopped opposite the bookcase where stood in a row the scriptures of the world, choicely bound and exquisitely printed, the late professor's most treasured possession, and next to them several books signed Pilgrim. One by one he took them from the shelf and hurled them through the open window. A devil's dreams, a devil's foolish dreams, he cried with a vicious laugh. Presently he stopped from sheer exhaustion. He turned his eyes slowly to the wall opposite, where hung a weird array of eastern swords and daggers, scimitars and spears, the collections of many journeys. He crossed the room and ran his finger along the edge. His mind seemed to waver. No, he muttered presently, not that way. There are easier and better ways than that. He took his hat and passed downstairs into the street. Chapter 5 It was five o'clock, and the June sun lay hot upon the pavement. He felt the metal doorknob burn the palm of his hand. Ah, Laidlaw, this is well met, cried a voice at his elbow. I was in the act of coming to see you. I have a case that will interest you, and besides I remember that you flavored your tea with orange leaves, and I admit it was Alexis Stephen, the great hypnotic doctor. I've had no tea today, Laidlaw said, in a dazed manner. After staring for a moment as though the other had struck him in the face, a new idea had entered his mind. What's the matter? asked Dr. Stephen quickly. Something's wrong with you? It's this sudden heat or overwork. Come, man, let's go inside. A sudden light broke upon the face of the younger man, the light of a heaven-sent inspiration. He looked into his friend's face and told a direct lie. Odd, he said. I myself was just coming to see you. 
I have something of great importance to test your confidence with. But in your house, please, as Stephen urged him towards his own door. In your house. It's only round the corner. I, I cannot go back there to my rooms till I have told you. I'm your patient for the moment, he added stammeringly, as soon as they were seated in the privacy of the hypnotist's sanctum. And I want, er, uh, my dear Laidlaw, interrupted the other, in that soothing voice of command which had suggested to many a suffering soul that the cure for its pain lay in the powers of its own reawakened will. I am always at your service, as you know. You have only to tell me what I can do for you, and I will do it. He showed every desire to help him out. His manner was indescribably tactful and direct. Dr. Laidlaw looked up into his face. I surrender my will to you, he said, already calmed by the other's healing presence, and I want you to treat me hypnotically and at once. I want you to suggest to me, his voice became very tense, that I shall forget, forget till I die, everything that had occurred to me during the last two hours, till I die, mind, he added with solemn emphasis, till I die. He floundered and stammered like a frightened boy. Alex Stephen looked at him fixedly without speaking. And further, Laidlaw continued, I want you to ask me no questions. I wish to forget for ever something I have recently discovered, something so terrible and yet so obvious that I can hardly understand why it is not patent to every mind in the world, for I have had a moment of absolute clear vision, of merciless clairvoyance. But I want no one else in the whole world to know what it is, least of all, old friend, yourself. He talked in utter confusion, and hardly knew what he was saying, but the pain on his face and the anguish in his voice were an instant passport to the other's heart. Nothing is easier, replied Dr. Stephen, after a hesitation so slight that the other probably did not even notice it. Come into my other room, where we shall not be disturbed. I can heal you. Your memory of the last two hours shall be wiped out as though it had never been. You can trust me absolutely. I know I can, Laidlaw said simply, as he followed him in. Chapter 6 An hour later they passed back into the front room again. The sun was already behind the houses opposite, and the shadows began to gather. I went off easily, Laidlaw asked. You were a little obstinate at first, but though you came in like a lion, you went out like a lamb. I let you sleep a bit afterwards. Dr. Stephen kept his eyes rather steadily upon his friend's face. What were you doing by the fire before you came here? he asked, pausing in a casual tone, as he lit a cigarette and handed the case to his patient. I? Let me see. Oh, I know. I was worrying my way through poor old Ebor's papers and things. I'm his executor, you know. Then I got weary and came out for a whiff of air. He spoke lightly and with perfect naturalness. Obviously he was telling the truth. I prefer specimens to papers, he laughed cheerily. I know, I know, said Dr. Stephen, holding a lighted match for the cigarette. His face wore an expression of content. The experiment had been a complete success. The memory of the last two hours was wiped out utterly. Laidlaw was already chatting gaily and easily about a dozen other things that interested him. Together they went out into the street, and at his door Dr. Stephen left him with a joke and a wry face that made his friend laugh heartily. "'Don't dine on the professor's old papers by mistake,' he cried, as he vanished down the street. Dr. Laidlaw went up to his study at the top of the house. Halfway down he met his housekeeper, Mrs. Fewings. She was flustered and excited. Her face was very red and perspiring. "'There have been burglars here,' she cried excitedly, "'or something funny. All your things is just any house, sir. I found everything all about everywhere.' She was very confused. In this orderly and very precise establishment, it was unusual to find a thing out of place. "'Oh, my specimens!' cried the doctor, dashing up the rest of the stairs at top speed. "'Have they been touched, or—' He flew to the door of the laboratory. Mrs. Fewings panted up heavily behind him. The laboratory ain't been touched, she explained breathlessly, but they smashed the library clock, and they've hung your gold watch, sir, on the skeleton's hands, 
and the books that weren't no value they flung out of the window just like so much rubbish. They must have been wild drunk, Dr. Laidlaw, sir. The young scientist made a hurried examination of the rooms. Nothing of value was missing. He began to wonder what kind of burglars they were. He looked up sharply at Mrs. Fewings, standing in the doorway. For a moment he seemed to cast about in his mind for something. Odd, he said at length. I only left here an hour ago, and everything was all right then. Was it, sir? Yes, sir. She glanced sharply at him. Her room looked out upon the courtyard, and she must have seen the books come crashing down, and also have heard her master leave the house a few minutes later. And what's this rubbish the brutes have left, he cried, taking up two slabs of worn gray stone on the writing table? Bath brick or something, I do declare. He looked very sharply again at the confused and troubled housekeeper. Throw them in the dust heap, Mrs. Fewings, and let me know if anything is missing in the house, and I will notify the police this evening. When she left the room, he went into the laboratory and took his watch off the skeleton's fingers. His face wore a troubled expression, but after a moment's thought it cleared again. His memory was a complete blank. I suppose I left it on the writing table when I went out to take the air, he said, and there was no one present to contradict him. He crossed to the window and blew carelessly some ashes of burned paper from the sill, and stood watching them as they floated away lazily over the tops of the trees. End of the Man Who Found Out